everybody. It looks like I've got four o'clock sharp. So I just want to say hello and thank you for attending um, another workshop. I appreciate it. Today I wanted to talk about some specific foods that lower cholesterol. Of course, you know me. I always like to give statistics. I always like to kind of set up the background of what we're talking about today um, and kind of give the overall general information and then we can kind of go into specifics. Um, you know, high blood pressure and high cholesterol are what we call silent killers because rarely will we have symptoms of that. And then all of a sudden you're being rushed to the hospital with a stroke or, a, you know, a heart attack. So, you know, of course, my role as a nutritionist is tr to try to prevent some of these nutrition related conditions. So these are definitely some tips that you can do to help prevent cholesterol, or if you do have high cholesterol to actually help mitigate that and lower it with um, natural foods. Um, I think the one challenge that I see in the medical community is, you know, I love my doctors, I work really closely with my docs, but you know, doctors are about medications. Um, so I really wish that the doctors would then, you know, send referrals to nutritionists to help a patient know what to eat. Because if you're on medications, great, we need them. But what good is that if we can't couple that with lifestyle? So of course, I'm going to show you the statistics. I mean, look at this. According to the CDC, 93 million U.S. adults aged 20 or older have a total cholesterol levels that are higher than 200. And I'm going to show you what the normal levels are. And even more disconcerting is the fact that our kids, our kids between the ages of 6 to 19 have, have high total cholesterol. And how dangerous is that? We all know that having a heart attack just doesn't happen overnight. It's going to develop over time. So we already see our kids, you know, ages six, seven, 10, 13 already have something called atherosclerosis, which is a consequence of high cholesterol, which will lead to stroke and heart attack. And remember that heart disease is still the number one killer of Americans uh, with cancer being number two. Stroke is number five, by the way. So this is just a lab report of one of my patients. Um, and the other thing that I encourage my surgeons do, you know, I, I teach medical school, so I'm teaching my, my physician to bees now to when you're talking to your patients, actually talk to them, have a conversation. Don't just give them the lab report and then expect them to know what it all means. So we like to have conversations with our, with our patients and our clients and say, okay, look, I have your lab work here, your lipid panel, you know, I don't want to make the assumption that you know what that means. So the lipid panel means that I'm looking at your total cholesterol, which is considered the bad cholesterol in, in its entirety if it's above the range. HDL cholesterol, which is actually considered the good cholesterol. And the reason why we consider it the good cholesterol is that the HDL actually helps to take some of the cholesterol away from the arteries, thereby like mitigating that atherosclerosis. Triglycerides is also part of a lipid panel. I'm going to show you shortly just what contributes to high triglyceride levels, which is just as dangerous as high total cholesterol. And then you got the LDL cholesterol, which we also consider the bad cholesterol cholesterol, because this, again, leads to heart disease. And then you've got total cholesterol to the HDL ratio. And this is something that the Heart Association put out to show you what kind of ratio might you have between bad cholesterol and good cholesterol. And it what it also does is kind of give you that risk factor of, of heart disease or risk of heart disease. So what should your levels be? Well, you know, when you look at different lab reports, this one shows you the range. OK, so different labs might have slightly different ranges, but this this is actually coming from the American Heart Association. So when you look at total cholesterol, you want to be less than 200. That's desirable. If you're between 200 and 239, that's borderline high. And certainly if you're 240 or greater, that certainly is high. And that's going to increase your risk of heart disease by a lot. So that's why I have some patients that tell me, hey, look, I'm on cholesterol medication, but my cholesterol is like 170. Shouldn't I go off of it? And I said, well, you need to talk to your doctor about that because perhaps your doctor's keeping you on that cholesterol medication to keep that cholesterol low. So sometimes it's even used prophylactically. So your total cholesterol, your goal is to be under 200. That's desirable. Now, the LDL cholesterol, which is also the bad cholesterol, if you can be less than 100, that's ideal. But 
between 100 to 129 is okay too. But as you increase 130 to 159, now you're getting that borderline high, 160 to 189 high, and certainly 190 and above, very high. You're putting yourself certainly at, at risk of stroke and heart disease. Now the triglycerides, um, you wanna be again, optimal would be less than 100. But most labs, what they show is as long as you're less than 150, that's actually considered normal too. But I like the lower, the better on the triglycerides. Um, borderline high, 150 to 199, 200 to 499 high and 500 and above very high. And I had a patient that actually had a triglyceride in the 700s. I even had a patient that had triglycerides in the 1100s, extremely dangerous. So what exactly is cholesterol? Cholesterol is a type of fat that's created by your own body. We actually create it. Um, we produce about 800 milligrams per day. And cholesterol is also found in our food. So if our body is making it and we're eating it, the levels can become very high. Now, why does our body make cholesterol? Well, cholesterol is very important for different structures of our body. As a matter of fact, cholesterol is found in all the different cell membranes of your body. So you have to have it. And it also creates the different hormones that we have, um, certain hormones like testosterone and estrogen and cortisol. It's also a component of vitamin D as well. So as you can see, this is something that our body produces because we need it. But unfortunately, what happens is sometimes genetically, we're making too much of it. And then that can also lead to that atherosclerosis or that heart disease. And then coupled with the fact if we don't have a good dietary lifestyle, that will exacerbate your condition as well. What excess cholesterol does is clog the arteries. It clogs up. And this is, you know, you just picture like a pipe in your house, you know, when you have all that hair stuck in your sink and then all of a sudden your water backs up. That's kind of like what happens in your arteries. It gets clogged. And uh, that's what this atherosclerosis is. It's like this fatty plaque that gets stuck to the inside of your arteries. And what makes this even worse is that your body almost treats that like an injury. So when you start building up atherosclerosis, your body thinks, oh man, that's an injury. And then it sends white blood cells and platelets to that area. And all that does is make the condition even worse. So now you've got fatty plaque and you, you really have a clog. That's what happens. And then if you can't get that blood supply through, what's going to happen? Well, depends. If you get, get clogged of your coronary arteries, then you're going to have a heart attack because you cannot nourish the heart with the blood that it needs to function. If you clog the arteries that um, send the blood to your brain, that's going to lead to a stroke. So you can get clogs in various parts of your body. Um, this kind of, I mentioned that. Okay, so how are we supposed to eat? You know, what's really interesting is that just recently, about a month or so ago, the um, Dietary Guidelines for Americans have just been republished. They publish that every five years. So you might want to get on uh, the internet and just Google Dietary Guidelines. And these guidelines are written uh, by the USDA in conjunction with... Um, the Health and Human Services, and they put out surveillance data on how the Americans actually eat, and they give suggestions on how we should eat. So it's a really great guide. Um, but this I just took from the CDC, and it's basically the same. What they do is they give you an estimation of what they think the American diet should be. You know, we should, we should keep our, our fat low, we should keep our sodium low, we should keep our sugar low. Well, unfortunately, when you look at the surveillance information about our diets, oh, we're completely the opposite. We have high calories, high fat intake, high sodium intake, high processed food intake, high sugar intake, high refined grain intake. Uh, you know, we're, we're going totally in the wrong direction. And what's interesting, it's not that this information is foreign. We know we're supposed to decrease our calories and decrease our fat and, you know, so, but why aren't we doing it? What's the motivator that prevents us from actually eating healthier? So I just wanted to mention these triglycerides. Triglycerides um, really became a focus of nutritionists um, a few years ago because we realized that the triglycerides are influenced by excessive sugar, alcohol intake, 
and excessive fat. So from your diet, you know, I, I might see that excessive triglyceride because I have a patient that drinks excessive alcohol. So that's helpful information for me because maybe I can hone in on that one aspect of that person's diet. Or this, it was just so interesting to finally get the research to show that excessive sugar intake, even from good sugar like fruit, can actually raise your triglycerides. And then that's not going to be so healthy for you anymore. So that's why sometimes in my lectures, you might hear me say, look, fruit is healthy for you. I want you to eat it, but I don't want you to eat fruit all day. And that's because of the fructose and the simple sugar that can actually contribute to high triglycerides. It's kind of crazy because I'll have my patients and clients even say to me, but Lil, I'm not eating a hot fudge sundae. I'm having mangoes. Yes, but you're having too many mangoes, right? That's a lot of sugar that you might be eating. Um, also, medications can cause high triglycerides. So, of course, if you are on medications, that's something that's going to be monitored by your doctor. And that's why, you know, you often get lab tests to make sure your lab levels are normal. So this is what I was mentioning before, high blood pressure and high cholesterol. They're called silent killers because we do not feel symptoms when our cholesterol is high. It's not until you're having that heart attack symptom that you feel it. So that's what makes this so much scarier because, you know, out of sight, out of mind, I'm not feeling any pain. So why should I change my diet? You know, or you get your lab report and say, oh man, yeah, my cholesterol is high, but I'm not feeling any symptoms. So sometimes we're less apt to change our dietary behavior because we're not feeling adverse reactions. And we kind of have to change that paradigm of thinking a little bit. Why, you know, let's prevent the problem, even though you might not be feeling pain. So some things to focus on, certainly a heart healthy diet would be something that, that would be very good. I saw a patient in the hospital the other day, actually yesterday, and she was in the hospital for a, um, a knee surgery that went bad, actually. And she had a really bad infection. And I walk in, you know, I, I wanted to talk to her about her diet. And the first thing she says to me is, this stupid hospital has me on a heart healthy diet. <laughs> I want a regular diet. And her perspective was, look, I'm not here for any heart issue. I'm here for my knee. But then when I was looking through her chart, her doctor had put her on a heart healthy diet because she's on a pacemaker. She has high blood pressure and she also has high cholesterol. So that was a good call that the doctor put her on a heart healthy diet. So I just needed to be there to explain that to her. Um, after she got over my explanation, she's like, oh, all right, that's fine. Keep me on the heart healthy diet. But a heart healthy diet actually focuses on different things. It focuses on high fiber. It focuses on saturated fat, especially because saturated fat actually raises cholesterol levels. And the more you raise your cholesterol levels, the problem you have. Trans fat, there is no room in the diet for a trans fat. Trans fats are just really bad for our health. Um, total fat. So here you might have, you know, 300 calories coming from fat. Well, what is that 300 calories made up of? Is it saturated fat or unsaturated fat? Is the good fat or the bad fat? But you have to look at the total amount of fat that somebody is eating. Same thing with cholesterol intake. Cholesterol in food is found in animal products. So if you, you are plant-based or if you're a vegan, you're really not getting that much cholesterol from your food because you're eating plants. But if you're eating any kind of animals, you know, eggs, dairy products, seafood, you know, poultry, all of that has cholesterol and it has varying disease, de, uh, degrees of fat as well. Um, plant stanols and sterols, I'm going to get to that in a minute. All right, so these, these are from the 2015-2020 guidelines, but they really haven't changed very much in the new guidelines, the 2020 to 2025. So what it's saying is that eat as little dietary cholesterol as possible, but there are no specific limits. However, I beg to differ with that because what I do as a nutritionist is I look at different recommendations. So this just might be just one recommendation from the dietary guidelines, but then when you look at the American Heart Association, they might give you different guidelines. So if I have a patient that I'm, or a client that I'm treating for high cholesterol, I'm going to try to control how much total cholesterol they're actually eating because I know that's going to contribute to their cholesterol levels. Same thing with saturated fat. 
we want you to eat no more than 10% of your calories coming from saturated fat. Now, what is saturated fat? Remember, saturated fat is found in all animal products. So that's why if, if we say, if you're a milk drinker, we'll say, you know, try to do non-fat milk because even though it's milk and it's an animal product, it's processed where we're taking out the fat or at least do a low fat. Same thing if you're doing yogurt and cheese. If you do eat animals, maybe you eat steak because you enjoy steak, we're gonna ask you to get a cut that's very lean, like a tenderloin or a sirloin. Things that say loin are usually lesser in saturated fat or a lean, uh, a lean protein might be a chicken breast or a turkey breast, something like that is very lean. What do we mean by that? It means that it's lower in saturated fat. That's what that means. Unsaturated fats are the good fats, things that are coming from nuts and olive oil and different nut oils and wheat germ and things like that. And then the trans fats, again, the guidelines say eat little to no um, it's very difficult to have no trans fats, especially if you eat processed foods, and most of us do. I mean, think about it, even technically speaking, a cereal is a processed food, you know, so you're going to have to read the food label and see if it has trans fats in it. At least now the food labels will tell us if it does. This is just a really nice poster that the American Heart Association puts out. I think it's just concise and it's just really nice. So you want to love it. What, what is it that we want to love? We want to love the oils and the unsaturated fats that have been shown to be heart healthy. So we're talking about fatty fish. We're talking about avocados. We're talking about different oils like olive oils. And I'm going to show you which ones I actually recommend. We're looking at seeds and nuts. Then we're looking at these things that are more saturated. So it says limit. So it doesn't mean you can never have butter. Thank goodness, because I'm British and I like my butter, right? But it doesn't mean use a lot of it. You still have to control how much in the total scheme of your diet. Same thing with cheese. Cheese is a big part of the American diet. So, and there's some cheeses you just can't get low fat. Um, you know, I like a nice Parmesan. How do you find a low fat Parmesan, right? Um, some of this where it says lose it, well, it's encouraging you to really limit these kinds of foods, these processed foods that have artificial trans fats and hydrogenation. And I just wanted to show you here how it actually has coconut oil. Coconut oil just really made its mark, I guess, a couple of years ago when it came out and everybody was eating coconut oil. And they, they're like, this is a healthier oil because it has a medium chain triglyceride. Well, that, that's true, um, but as you can see, it's still not endorsed as the type of oil to use, according to the American Heart Association, that frequently. And when you look at other countries that really use a lot of coconut oil as their base for their cooking, like India, the Caribbean, um, Puerto Rico, we see higher incidence of heart disease partly do because of their diet. So it doesn't mean that you can't use coconut oil. Of course you can. But again, you've got to do it in that moderation where you're not just using coconut oil as your main source of oil. So this is just um, kind of a review. All right, so what do you look for when you look at different um, food labels? Well, what's really nice about food labeling now is it really does give you a lot of information. The only problem is sometimes it's really confusing because that package is, is very confusing. You got the marketing and then you got the sale price and then you got the ingredient list and you it's just, there's too much to look at. So when you're looking at the nutrition facts label, if you're trying to reduce the fat in your diet, I recommend looking for a product that has less than 6.5 grams or so per serving. So if you compared regular cheese to low fat cheese, that would tell you right there, a slice of, <coughs> excuse me, regular cheese might have 10 grams of fat. So go to low fat because that might have anywhere from three to five grams of saturated fat. 
So that, or, or total fat. So that's why you want to start looking at food labels. And really, it depends on what your goals are. I have another client of mine. She's like, all right, do I need to look at the fat or do I look at the cholesterol or do I look at the sodium? It does depend on what your goals are. So this particular client that I'm thinking about, her goal is to lower sodium. So she's going to really pay attention to that sodium content. If you're trying to lower your cholesterol or lower your weight or lower your triglycerides, you really want to look at your fat intake. All right. So just overall, this is just general. The types of food that actually helps you lower your cholesterol naturally would be whole grains. So that means, you know, if you are on a carbohydrate restricted diet, like a lot of us are, you got to get bang for your buck. So if you decide I'm going to have some, some carbs, make sure they're whole grains, that they're complex carbohydrates. All vegetables will help you lower cholesterol, all of them, because they're high in fiber, they're high in antioxidants, they're just really good for us, and they're low calorie. They have no cholesterol in them either, so they're very low fat, unless you put a whole bunch of cheese sauce on your broccoli, that's different, okay, but all vegetables would be good for us. Fruits are also good for us as well because of the soluble fiber and the insoluble fiber. But again, you don't want to do fruit in excess because of the fructose. That's going to contribute to high triglycerides. So you might ask me, okay, Lo, so you're, telling, you're picking on fruit. How much fruit should I have a day? Well, based on different calorie levels, I usually say, look, fruit is good for us. Why don't you limit your fruit to about two servings a day? Okay, so what does that mean? All right, so in the morning, you enjoy your strawberries with your oatmeal. Okay, do a half a cup of strawberries. That's actually one serving. And then you turn around to me and say, yeah, but I like my orange juice too. Okay, well, if you do four to six ounces of orange juice, that's another serving. There's your servings. So you get two servings, there you have it. So that means later on, if you want a snack, you're not gonna go for an orange, even though that might seem like a healthier snack than a Snickers bar. Maybe you'll go for some salad or you'll go for a vegetable or something else. So it really is kind of a mixed message, but the message here is fruit is healthy for us, but we still need to control the serving of fruit. Fatty fish, fatty fish just means that it's not so much the white fish. <laughs> so if you have grouper or you have snapper or tilapia, those are, or flounder, those are white fleshy fish that aren't as fatty. They don't have as much of the omega-3s. They still have it, but not as much as compared to a fatty fish like salmon or um, swordfish or tuna or sardines or mackerel. Those are more oily fish. And even though they have fat, it's the omega-3s, it's the good fat. So you want to make up the, the bulk of your fat intake from those kinds of foods. Nuts and seeds, you know, I always pick on nuts and seeds too, because that's the other thing I see in my practice that people are eating a lot of nuts. They're just overdoing it and then wondering why they're gaining weight. So I'm going to talk about some specific nuts I want you to eat. Monounsaturated oils. Look, we have to cook with oils. We eat oils. We might put oils on our salad. So what would be the best ones? I'm going to talk about that. And then, of course, dark chocolate. Of course, chocolate sometimes is a trigger food. And I'm only saying that because it's my trigger food. So if you're going to eat chocolate, get bang for your buck and try to do a dark chocolate, which means it has at least 70% cacao, which is actually the plant, right? It doesn't have all that butter and lecithin and coconut and, you know, all the stuff that's mixed into it. Um, but it's a little bitter. So you have to kind of get used to that flavor. All right, so that was just general. So when you think about your diet, you might think, okay, well, I have some fruit, I have some strawberries, I eat my salad, I have my oatmeal, all of those are good. That's gonna help you lower cholesterol. But I'm gonna hone in on these 10 particular foods because of their specific properties that can help you lower your cholesterol naturally. So one of the oils that I really enjoy using is avocado oil. It tends to be a little bit pricier. So, you know, maybe you can wait for a sale if you've never had it before, but it's approximately 71% monounsaturated fat, which is the good fat. So when you look at the actual oil, a greater percentage of it comes from the good fat. It also has a high heat index, which means that if you're stir frying, you're not gonna burn the oil and then have some funky tasting stir fry. So that's good. 
It also has high amounts of, um, of a fatty acid called oleic acid, which also helps to lower our cholesterol. It's high in an HDL and low in an LDL cholesterol. And it helps you to reduce your triglycerides. So that is great. So if you're eating an oil that can actually help you reduce triglycerides and reduce LDL, that's always a good thing. It also contains high in vitamin E. And just as a side note, vitamin E is very good for our blood. Um, it helps keep things flowing. Um, it also is an antioxidant. So it helps to protect us against heart disease and free radical damage and cancer. So that's always good. Um, but you still have to watch the portion because an oil is an oil. So one tablespoon will give you approximately 120 calories and about 14 grams of total fat. Okay, so it still has a lot of fat. It doesn't mean you have a free for all. You still have to control the amount that you use. The other type of oil that I really like is olive oil. So I would say the two oils on top of the list to help lower cholesterol would be the avocado oil and the olive oils. Um, olive oil, especially the extra virgin olive oil, is approximately 75% monounsaturated fat which is really great. And again, the more unsaturated fat, the more monounsaturated fat, the healthier it is for your heart because it's helping to lower total cholesterol, lower LDL, lower triglycerides, just like the avocado oil, and overall um, lower total cholesterol. What's nice about um, olive oil as well is it, it also has properties that are anti-inflammatory. And we do know that one aspect of disease is when we have an, an inflammatory response. Inflammatory responses can cause heart disease, arthritis, stroke, cancer. Um, you definitely want to choose extra virgin olive oil just because that's going to have the most nutritional value. It has um, most of the phenols and all the great stuff that you want to have. The only problem is it doesn't really have a high heat index. So that's why you have to kind of be careful when you cook with it. Um, you, you might want to cook with the avocado oil and then use the olive oil just to finish things off. You know, use it at the end as your salad dressing or as your flavoring for the end. That's how I like to use it. But again, you got to watch the portion because one tablespoon of this oil also has about 120 calories and 14 grams of total fat. So this is just the comparative. So 120 calories, 14 grams of fat. It's pretty equal in the saturated fat, which is pretty low. Um, it's pretty equal in the monounsaturated. And avocado oil has a little bit more polyunsaturated. And actually the olive oil has a little higher in vitamin E. <laughs> so when you do the comparison, it's pretty similar, but these two oils, make sure they're on your shelf. I think these are really good for our heart health and also to lower cholesterol. The other um, food that I wanna hone in on are legumes. Now, all the legumes are healthy for us. A legume are the beans, right? The black beans, the pink beans, the kidney beans, right? But I'm gonna hone in on garbanzo beans, which are also called chickpeas. There are lots of different health benefits, but what I really love about chickpeas or garbanzo beans is that it helps to lower both the total cholesterol and the LDL. So both, and remember, those are both the bad cholesterol. Um, what's really nice about garbanzo beans too is it does a whole host of other things. It's, it can promote weight loss. There is actually some studies to show that. And the reason for that is that um, it's filled with fiber. And whenever you have fiber, that's gonna naturally lower blood sugar, cholesterol. Um, it helps with weight loss because now you're feeling full. Um, fiber also helps bowel function as well because we got to keep those bowels working as well. Um, so that's why the chickpeas, the garbanzo beans are just one of my favorite. And they're very versatile because you can eat them cold. You can eat them roasted. You can eat them in a stew. You can eat, I mean, you, they're just, you can eat them. I mean, not a lot of people will just eat cold black beans, <laughs> right? That's, that's kind of different than the garbanzo where you can just eat it cold in a salad, right? The other thing that I like about the garbanzo beans is that it, it really has a lot of very healthy um, vitamins and minerals that are needed for our healthy blood. So when you look at the folate, folate is a vitamin that actually helps to prevent pernicious anemia. It also helps our heart by lowering something called homocysteine. So it's going to help your heart 
because it helps lower your cholesterol and your LDL, but it also helps lower homocysteine, which also helps your heart. Um, it has copper, which is actually good for your blood. It's good for protein. Um, you know, it's a plant-based protein, but that's very good too. It's high in iron, which is good for your blood. Again, it's good for with zinc, which is good for immunity. So all of these ingredients, again, you get bang for your buck when you're eating garbanzo beans. Just gave you a quick little recipe here too. Uh, this is something you don't, doesn't even need cooking. It's just, it's just a garbanzo bean salad. And basically all it is, is you just put whatever you want in there. If you got some leftover, you know, celery and tomatoes and, you know, herbs, just throw it in there and just make a nice healthy salad. Um, so this is just a little recipe I provided for you. Now, my next favorite food are lentils. Now, lentils are pulses. They're actually in a category called pulses. And there are, again, lots of health benefits of lentils. And what's really fun about lentils is, as you can see by this picture, they come in all different um, colors. And some of them hold up a little bit better in soups and stews. Like the other day, I had made a lentil soup with these um, kind of tan looking ones. And then I made the same lentil soup with the orange ones. And it didn't hold up very well. It totally disintegrated. You didn't even know you were eating a lentil. So different lentil colors will have different cooking properties. So you'll have to see what you enjoy eating. But again, what, what do I love about lentils? Not only does it reduce your LDL, but it increases your good cholesterol, your HDL. And what was really cool is when I was going through dietetic school many years ago, I remember my professor saying, look, the only way you can really raise your HDL is by exercise. And because it's genetically you know, programmed. So exercise definitely helps HDL, but you're really not going to find too many foods that do that. Well, Years later, we're finding, no, that's actually not true. There are certain foods that can raise your good cholesterol, and lentils are one of them. So that's why I really love it. The higher the HDL, the better. It's very protective for your heart. Um, so much so that the, the range of the labs actually changed. At one time, we were really happy if somebody had like an HDL of 35. <laughs> now we want you to have an HDL level of at least 45. And the higher it is, the better. The other thing that's really nice about lentils is, again, it contains all that nice fiber that's good for your heart and your body. It does contain a good level of iron as well. So again, another plant source of iron, which is good for our you know, plant-based eaters or our vegans and our vegetarians. So looking at this profile of cooked lentils, this is about one cup. Again, it's, it's very high in that folic acid, which is so good for us. Again, it has the copper, it has the fiber, it's got the manganese, got the iron, it's got the protein. Again, a very good source of protein. It even has something called vitamin B1, which is thiamine. And thiamine is really good for metabolism, especially metabolism of carbohydrates. It's got pentathenic acid, it has B6. So it's just a really healthy food. Um, and what's nice about lentils is that it doesn't have a very strong flavor. You know, it's very mild. So what's nice about that is you can really jazz it up in terms of where you want to put it. So this recipe, I just stuck this recipe on there. It's an easy lentil soup. Again, something that's really easy. It's not going to require so much cooking, something that you can throw in one pot or one crock pot and kind of be done with it. Um, but then it'll last you a couple of days, which is really nice. Um, one trick that I do is I always rinse my lentils. Um, just because remember the dried lentils, sometimes it has little bits of, it almost seems like sand or rocks. <laughs> you want to rinse it. And then I soak them because then they cook really, really fast. Okay, nuts are really good for us. We know that. But I think one of the best nuts are walnuts. They kind of look like little brains too. So that even tells you they're even good for your brain. One of the reasons why I really, really love walnuts is because of the behavioral aspect of eating walnuts. Rarely will I find any of my clients or patients overdo walnuts. Almonds, that's a different story. You can eat a whole bag. Cashews, pistachios, we tend to run away with those. But 
Walnuts, for some reason, you're not sitting there eating a whole bag of walnuts. And that's a good thing because I'm trying to control the calories as well. But walnuts are very unique because they contain omega-3s and omega-6s. Um, they provide vitamin E. They are so power packed with vitamin E. They have all different carotenoids, which are healthy for us, anti-inflammatory. It contains zinc again, which is good for our immunity. It has selenium. Selenium is a really amazing mineral because it's an antioxidant. It really keeps us healthy. It's got manganese, which is good for our blood. It's got copper. It's good for our blood. But again, talking about cholesterol, what does it do? It helps to lower the LDL and lower the total cholesterol. And that's why I like walnuts a lot. And then when you look at this, it also contains biotin, which is nice. That's good for our hair. It's got manganese, got molybdenum, copper, omega-3s. Um, definitely eat the skin if you can tolerate it. It's a little bitter, but actually if you can eat the skin of a walnut, which means you'd have to crack it yourself, which actually slows down your eating of them. That's kind of fun to do. Um, that actually also has more fiber in it as well. I know you guys probably have seen this table before because I've shown it before, um, but I just like to show you the comparative of calories and fat from nuts. So almonds, one ounce, 163 calories. Again, it still has a lot of sat, um, total fat, your Brazilian nuts, your cashews. So you can kind of see the numbers, macadamias, walnuts. So one ounce, how much is that? Okay, one ounce of almonds, depends on the size, but it's approximately 22 to 24 almonds. Let me tell you, that doesn't seem like much, especially if you're sitting there snacking or maybe you're, you know, you got that nut, that nut uh, bowl there while you're playing cards. And then before you know it, you're eating a lot of nuts, you're eating a lot of calories and you're eating a lot of total saturated fat or unsaturated or total fat. Uh, Brazilian nuts, uh, they are so fatty that even when you bite into it, you can almost see the oil. So Brazilian nuts, a serving size is anywhere between three to five, that's it. Cashews, about 14. Chestnuts, a little bit more, maybe about 15 or so. Hazelnuts, uh, less than 20. Macadamia is very high in fat, so we keep those low, usually about 10. Pecans, uh, about 20. Pistachios, believe it or not, you can have about 40 pistachios. <laughs> um, and if you have them in the shell, that's even better because you'll eat them slower. And then walnuts, anywhere between three to five whole walnuts. Okay, so again, it's not very big serving sizes. So usually what I try to encourage my clients and patients to do is nuts are really good for us, but be careful if you're going to use it as a snack food. I'd rather you use it as a condiment. So that means you're going to put a serving in your yogurt, or you're going to put a serving in your salad, or you're going to put a serving in your oatmeal, or you're going to crust your fish with it. You know, use it as a condiment rather than a snack. And if you're going to use it as a snack, count them out. You got to portion control it. Otherwise, we tend to eat way too many. They're trigger foods, and they're easy to eat. And one after the other, you're eating them. Here you go with the pistachios. So we've got walnuts, and we've got pistachios. And what I really love about pistachios is that it really, really has been shown to reduce that cholesterol by 67% and LDL by 10% and triglycerides by 14%. So it gives you that three point whammy there. We're lowering all the things that are bad for us in terms of cholesterol. There has been some study to show that pistachios also reduce blood pressure and that's always an added benefit to your heart. Um, they're high in protein, which is nice. Um, look at this, about one ounce. Well, this one says 49. Usually I say about anywhere between 42 to 44, but this, this uh, reference at 49 nuts has about six grams of protein in it, which is about the same as one uh, large egg. And this is a, a fun fact. In China, pistachios are known as the happy nut because they look like they're smiling. They kind of do. <laughs> it's often given as a gift during the Chinese New Year and pistachios are a symbol of health, happiness, and good fortune. So I kind of like that message.
All right, now fish. We were talking about fatty fish. Now, before everybody passes out, because I'm saying sardines, I know they're not a very easy fish to eat, but they are one of the healthiest fishes to eat. Now, you know, if we were living in Greece or Italy, we could get the actual sardine, which is really nice, the actual fish, and, you know, really have a nice dinner out of that. But here in the States, what do we get? We get the stuff in the tin or the stuff in the box. Um, but they do taste a little bit fishier. I agree with that, but they are so good for us. So if we can kind of get over that, maybe put some lemon juice on it or some vinegar to kind of mute that, they are so good for us. And again, it's, it's a food that lowers the triglycerides as well as the cholesterol levels. And not only that, it's a really great source of vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is a vitamin that's very good for our blood. It helps to prevent, again, just like folic acid, pernicious anemia but it's also good to prevent peripheral neuropathy. So it's even good for our nerve tissue. It's actually involved in DNA synthesis. So it's really good for us. So sardines are just, you know, I know it's a harder fish to eat, especially if you're not a big fish eater, but it really is so good for us. Um, what else does it have? It's very high in selenium. This is about three ounces so good. Omega-3s, phosphorus, actually, which is good for our bones. Uh, it's a good source of protein. Look at this. It's a good source of vitamin D. Vitamin D is good for our bones. It's good for our immunity. It's just, you know, it's, it's very, very good. It's a steroid, really. So it's really good for us. It also has calcium. It's really hard to get calcium from a lot of foods. So it does have calcium. It's got B3, which is niacin, which is also good for our heart. It has iodine. It's got copper, B2, which is a riboflavin, and choline. What's interesting about choline is choline helps our insulin work better. So this would also be a very good food if you have insulin resistance or if you have diabetes. This would also be a good food for that. And it's pretty low in calories as well because it's a fish. So usually the way I eat it, I, I like to sprinkle some lemon juice or some olive oil on there because, you know, I want to kind of mute that fishiness out of it. Um, sometimes I might use it in a salad. Um, sometimes I'll use it kind of like as a replacement for tuna. So I'll put it with some mayo, with some, you know, celery and things like that. Um, but the more herbs that you can do, the better it is. It kind of mutes that fishiness a little bit. Um, and it's just, it's a very enjoyable fish if you can really get used to it. Hope you like it. You should try it if you've never had it. And just know that it is one of the healthiest fish out there. The other thing too that's nice about sardines is because they're small, they don't hold a lot of mercury as well. And I know mercury is a big deal. All right, so we had to put salmon on this list. Now, salmon is good for us. It is good in those omega-3s, and it has that favorable ratio between the omega-3s and the omega-6s. Now, an omega-6 is a polyunsaturated fatty acid, and if we eat too many omega-6s, it's very inflammatory, believe it or not. So that's why we want more of those omega-3s. Omega-3s are actually, there are two types, one that's called DHA and one that's called EPA. And those are the big long names. I can pronounce it to impress you if you want. Dacosa hexaenoic acid and icosa pentaenoic acid. And that's really what those fatty acids are. So that's why if you take a fatty acid, you know, a, a fish pill, right, an omega-3 fish pill, you got to read the label to see if it has both DHA and EPA, because both of them are good for us. Um, so good for our, our cholesterol, good for our heart, reduces triglycerides, helps our blood flow, um, just really, really good for us. One of the challenges with salmon, of course, is that many salmon um, choices are farm raised. And I do know that there was some controversy about farm raised salmon because of the agricultural or fish agricultural practice, um, showing that there was higher contamination just because of the farming practice. So, you know, it's kind of controversial. You know, you almost want to say, look, I want you to get wild salmon, but sometimes that's not available. Sometimes it's so expensive, it might not be, you know, realistic for some people. And then you also have to still worry about mercury because that's natural in the environment. So, you know, what do we do? Do we not eat it or do we eat it? I say that still the good is going to outweigh the bad. It's the same concept of fruits and vegetables, right? A lot of people will say to me, well, I don't want to eat a lot of fruits and vegetables because they have pesticides in them. But I'm telling you, eating them outweighs the pesticide. It's actually going to protect us from the pesticides. So I would say eat it. It's good for us. 
The other thing you might even consider is even canned. If you can't get fresh or wild caught, do the canned, especially the ones that say wild caught in the can. There's, there's no reason why we shouldn't eat something like that. Um, what's nice about salmon too is it the eating it and the omega-3s also helps our joints. So if you tend to have arthritis, that inflammatory arthritis, that salmon, the omega-3s helps to decrease that. It's, it's shown to help improve mood and cognition. I don't know, I'm always cranky and I eat a lot of salmon, I don't know. Um, it reduces risk for macular degeneration. <laughs> macular degeneration is a big problem, especially in our older population. And it's a weird kind of blindness. It's like, um, it's, it's, this, it's this blindness where you can't see centrally. It's, it's, so it's not a full blindness, it's a partial blindness. Um, it also decreases cancer because it's anti-inflammatory and it's a really good protein to maintain our lean body mass. So again, good for our, good for our heart, good to prevent uh, lower cholesterol and good just all around. So if you do like to cook, this is just a nice simple, you know, recipe uh, with salmon. And I kind of stuck in a mint salsa in there so you can get some fresh vegetables in there and it just tastes really, really good. All right, oatmeal. A lot of my, my clients will say, oh, I'm eating oatmeal that lowest cholesterol. That's what it says on the package. And you're absolutely right. Oatmeal is very good for us. And it's not just because it has good fiber. It also has something in it called beta glucan. And the beta glucans is what also helps to lower our cholesterol. Um, it helps, helps to lower LDL as well. Oats are actually a member of a grass family, just like quinoa, believe it or not. Now there are three different types and sometimes this gets confusing for some people because I have my clients say to me, well, should I just do the steel cut? Oh, okay, it depends on how much time you wanna spend cooking your oatmeal. So you've got old fashioned oatmeal, which is also called regular or rolled oats. Okay, and basically what happens there is they take the oat, the groat, and then they crush it, they steam it basically. So they're, it's par cooked a little bit and then they roll it and dry it. Then you've got the quick and instant rolled oats because you only have five minutes to get out the door and they're rolled thinner. So it cooks really, really fast. And then you've got the steel cut oats, which is the actual groat. It's the actual kernel. And what they do is they roast it usually and then they cut it into smaller pieces. So because it's not rolled and pre-steamed, it is going to take a longer time um, to cook. It, it does have a a different consistency. It's nutty. It's chewy. Some people like that. Some people don't like that. So I would say is one better than the other. I say whichever one you can fit into your lifestyle is the one that I want you to have. I know when my dad was alive, he would do the quick and instant rolled oats. He wasn't going to sit there all day <laughs> and start cooking oatmeal. So that was the best one for him. One trick that you can do, not so much with the steel cut oats is um, I'll come back to this, is I know you've heard of the overnight oats. Um, and that works well with either the rolled, old fashioned or the quick cooking. And basically you're kind of eating semi-raw, even though they're steamed already while they're processed, but you're not really cooking it. You're just putting everything together in a little mason jar or a little bowl, and you're putting some sort of wet ingredient in there because it's got to soak up that stuff. So either an almond milk or a juice or a milk, um, and then you just mix it with whatever you want to mix it with. So this is just a recipe for overnight oats. This one has, this one uses unsweetened almond milk. It also gives you some yogurt too, and then you're putting some seeds, if you want to put some flavor, if you want to put some fruit in there. So you just put it all together, put it in some sort of bowl or mason jar and stick it in the fridge overnight. That's why it's called overnight oats. And then in the morning, you just eat it and it can, it's cold. You can eat it cold. The other thing that I like about oatmeal is that, again, when you look at the nutrition profile, it's, it's really, it's got a nice nutrition profile. Again, it has phosphorus, which is good for our bones, manganese, molybdenum, biotin, B1, magnesium. Again, magnesium is good for our blood pressure and our heart. It's got chromium. It's got fiber, zinc. So it's just, when you look at different superfoods, I think this is a very good food to include in your diet. And, you know, some people will say to me, look, I hate oatmeal. <laughs> and I'm thinking about my husband, actually. He's like, yeah, no, I'm not eating oatmeal. 
and yet he'll eat an oatmeal cookie. So what I do is I've created, you know, healthier oatmeal cookies where I'm actually making, I'm using oatmeal, but I'm using, you know, a sugar substitute. I'm using different nuts and I'm making it into a cookie and then he's eating it. Well, guess what? <laughs> he's eating oatmeal. The other thing I like to use oatmeal for is when, when you make your homemade granola. Um, so oatmeal is just very versatile. You can also use it in food. That's what I like about oatmeal too. So you can actually, you know, use it in your meatloafs and, and things like that. You can crush it and you can use it as a coating. So it's very versatile. All right, so in, uh, vegetables, we know all of them are healthy for us, all of them. But again, I wanna hone in on, you know, number 10, which is asparagus. And the reason why I really love asparagus to help lower the cholesterol is because we know that asparagus lowers the cholesterol by doing something called binding your excess bile acid. <laughs> that sounds very complicated. Basically what bile is, is it's created by your liver and it's stored in the gallbladder and it helps you to break down fat when you eat it. So excess bile, unfortunately, can contribute to higher cholesterol levels. So anything that can bind it and get rid of it is a good thing. So, and we make bile. So, you know, you're not going to bind so much that you can't digest your fat. So asparagus lowers the cholesterol by doing that, which is really good. And believe it or not, there is some medications. That's how they work. That's how they lower your cholesterol. They're binding excessive bile acids. So why not we just do it naturally by having asparagus? I know sometimes that, you know, there's, there's that um, side effect of eating asparagus. When you urinate, it kind of has that strong kind of funky smell. And that's kind of the sulfurs and the stuff that you're actually excreting. But asparagus is loaded with vitamins and minerals. And actually, researchers have identified nearly 100 phytonutrient compounds. That is power packed. Let me tell you, this is such a good, good vegetable. It's anti-inflammatory, which means it's going to help you reduce your risk of cancer and diabetes and high blood pressure. The best way to eat asparagus is if you can do a quick saute or a quick steam. You don't want to make it too mushy. Or even if you roast it, you know, put a little bit of that avocado oil or that olive oil um, and roast it. And boy, oh boy, it is just so good for us. And look at all of these, these other nutrients. It's just wild. Look at this. Again, good with folic acid. It has vitamin K. Vitamin K is good for blood clotting. Um, folic, folic acid, good for our blood. Again, copper, B1, selenium. It has some vitamin C. How nice is that? Vitamin C is an antioxidant that helps us. Um, phosphorus, fiber, manganese. So just look at this profile. It's just really, really good for us. Other notable foods to lower cholesterol, of course, the dark chocolate, like I mentioned, blueberries and raspberries, those, those berries are really good for us. So if you're going to focus on fruit and you're worried about the sugar, when you look at berries, they're very, very sweet, but they're actually very low on the glycemic index because they're so high in fiber. So get bang for your buck. Get some blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, strawberries, um, eggplant, believe it or not, actually is a notable to help lower our cholesterol. Unless, of course, you're frying it and you're making it very fatty, then that could be a problem. Um, barley is really good for us. We talked about barley last month, about how good that was for us anyway. And then any kind of dark green leafy vegetables, spinach, kale, Swiss chard, that's all going to be good for us to lower cholesterol. Remember, the higher the fiber, the better it is for us. So some of my clients say, okay, so I have high cholesterol. What do I do about eggs? Can I eat them? Can I not eat them? And the information is so confusing. One day you can eat them. The next day you can't eat them. What do I do? So this is what I say. Remember, our body makes cholesterol. So you, if you have high cholesterol and you eat animal products, you just have to kind of control how much animal product you're eating because all animal products have varying amounts of cholesterol. So why do we pick on eggs? Well, one medium-sized egg, and this is medium, medium-sized egg, the yolk actually contains about 186 milligrams of cholesterol. And I would really want to control your cholesterol intake to about 300 milligrams a day, because I know you're already making it. 
So that's why it doesn't mean you can't eat them, but if you're battling high cholesterol, I might want to control how many egg yolks you eat. I don't want to take it away altogether though, because egg yolks are healthy for us. Egg yolks have other vitamins and minerals that are good for us. So that's why can we eat eggs even if we have high cholesterol? The answer is yes and no. Yes, you can eat them, but you don't want to eat them every day. So that's why there's that big push to eat more egg whites or egg substitute because the egg whites have, have lower cholesterol. I wouldn't say none, but it has much lower cholesterol. It would be the yolk that's much higher and it also has the fat which also contributes to the cholesterol. So what's really interesting though is that we even see that eggs raise the HDL. So if you get those special eggs, you'll see that um, you know sometimes they feed these chickens omega-3 diets. Get those because that means those omega-3s are actually higher in that egg. So that's good because the more omega-3s, the lower your triglycerides. So again, get bang for your buck. What's nice about um, eggs too, even the yolk, is that it's high in choline and zinc. So that's good for your blood and immunity and blood sugar. And it does have um, antioxidants, specifically something called lutein and zeaxanthin, which are very good for us. So when you read the research for about 70% of the population, and this was based on that one study, there is no increase in total or LDL cholesterol. But again, I don't work on just, you know, statistics. I have to work with my client. So I know, and I'm thinking about her right now, she, her cholesterol went through the roof. And I said, okay, let's look at your diet. Is there anything in your diet? And what she had been doing is she started to eat eggs, but every single day. So for her, it was actually affecting her cholesterol levels. So she agreed to just reduce it. Now she's doing three per week, and then she's doing more egg whites. Um, some people may also experience a mild increase in LDL. Sometimes I see that. Okay. All right. So what is my recommendation? My recommendation at one time, the American Heart Association was saying, even if you have high cholesterol, you can have one whole egg a day. But the problem with that message is remember that we're eating other things throughout the day that might actually be made with eggs. So that means you're actually intaking more than that one per day. So that's why I like to change that recommendation a little bit, and it appears to be safe to have up to about three whole eggs. Um, actually, this is per week. <laughs> Sorry, not per day, but per week. Um, and then, of course, substitute with your egg whites and your alternative. Now, what are plant sterols? Plant sterols and stanols are things that are naturally found in certain foods, but we know that it actually blocks the absorption of cholesterol from food. And that's a good thing because that would mean that that naturally lowers cholesterol as well. So research shows that if you have three servings a day, that can actually reduce your cholesterol by 20 points. That's a lot, especially if you're on the borderline. So the National Cholesterol Education Program recommends that we eat about two grams of plant sterols or stanols every single day. <laughs> well, where would you find this stuff from? Well, look at this. Another reason to have pistachio nuts <laughs> or olive oil, right? So some of these foods naturally contain plant sterols. So you're getting bang for your buck here. The other thing you can do is you can look at different products, like instead of using butter, you might use a product like this called Smart Balance. Um, and when you read the ingredients, this actually has plant sterols in it. And this, this provides about 400 milligrams per serving, which is good. So again, that can be a choice. Instead of doing butter, you'll do Smart Balance. This is another one that's out on the market called Benacol. I think this was one of the originals too. So each serving of Benacol contains about 500 milligrams of phytosterol. So that's really good. And then my last quick talk would be about taking supplements to lower cholesterol. I know some of my clients were taking the red yeast rice and you know, I'm a nutritionist. So I always wanna promote food first over anything that might be in a supplement form. And one of the reasons for that is I'm pretty conservative especially when it comes to different herbals just because I know they're manufactured a little bit differently. They're regulated a little bit differently. And there have been some cases in the literature to show that some of these herbals especially red yeast rice 
price has been contaminated and actually hurt people instead of help them. And what's really interesting about red yeast rice is that um, it does contain a chemical in it. And I think I put the name here, the monocolon K, which actually is the active ingredient that actually helps to lower cholesterol. But what's really interesting is that once the FDA realized that, hey, this over-the-counter natural ingredient can help lower the cholesterol, it was competing with the actual drug companies. So guess who won out? The drug companies. So now when you buy red yeast rice over the counter, it's going to have very little, if any, of the active ingredient that helps to lower the cholesterol. So why buy it to begin with? Um, as a matter of fact, you might actually increase your risk of getting a contaminated product. You know, it, at one time, it was a really good product if it was produced naturally because it lowered the LDL and, you know, it really did help, but it's not really something I recommend to my patients um, just because of that problem. So I just kind of wanted to bring that up to you. So these are just some of the, the problems with it. Yeah, I've read some studies where it caused this patient to go into kidney failure. So we definitely don't need that. And these were some of the side effects too. All right, and probably one of the reasons too is again, the manufacturing, where it might be coming from, where is the ingredients coming from, you know, so just be careful with that. There are safety concerns. Okay, so really what was the take home message of this lecture? Well, to lower or prevent high cholesterol, you wanna limit your total fat intake. Now, if you really wanna be diligent about that, you have to know how many calories you're eating and then take a percentage of how much fat you might be eating. So according to all the guidelines, you need to keep your total fat intake between 30 to 35% of your calories. So if you're saying, okay, that's too much work, give me an easier way to do that. Well, focus on the fats that you do eat being the better fats, things that come from your fatty fish, things that come from your nuts, things that come from your good oils. You want to reduce saturated fat. And the only way to do that is you have to eat low fat. So if you're doing dairy, you got to do low fat. If you're eating animal products, you got to do better cuts. You got to do the sirloins. If you do pork, you got to do the pork tenderloin. If you're doing um, fish, you want to do the fatty fish, uh, things like that. Try to be careful of the trans fats. And that is impossible to stay away from if you're eating the processed foods like cookies and crackers and things like that. You've got to read the ingredients. Definitely increase your fiber. I think we can naturally do that by having our vegetables, having our legumes, having your oatmeal, having your garbanzo beans, all of that has fiber. And lo and behold, if you want to increase your fiber intake, take some Metamucil. Um, that's actually a trick that I, that I recommend to a lot of my clients and patients, even if they don't have bowel issues. Metamucil is a type of psyllium fiber that actually helps to lower cholesterol, lower blood sugar, lower weight because you're feeling full, and it helps with the plumbing. And you can actually get Metamucil in an unflavored, so you can mix it in different things. Um, add two grams of the phytosterols. Again, you can do that by getting bang for your buck. If you're using olive oil, you're getting some of the plant sterols. Instead of using butter, maybe get a Benicol, you know, get something like that. Um, I really don't recommend taking those cholesterol lowering supplements. And if you do want to venture to do that, make sure you talk to your doctor and pharmacist before you do to make sure that it's not contraindicated in any of your medications. And then of course, eat the foods that we talked about, because I think that could overall be healthy for you and help lower your cholesterol. These are just some of my references that I use. This is a really great website. You should get on this website. It's called the World's Healthiest Foods. And this is where I got a lot of this information from. And it, it, it talks about a bunch of different foods and why they're healthy for us. And it gives you recipes. It's a really, really reputable website. All right, that's the end of my lecture. All right, tell me, what questions might you have? Let's see, anything in the chat? Oh, nobody's chatting with me. Any, any comments, any questions? Everybody's doing okay? Great, look. Great. Oh, very good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Wait, I